Hi, welcome to the wifexpert.com podcast. My name is Lori McDermott. Today I have a guest and like all my guests, I've never talked to them ahead of time. I want to hear what they have to say with you. So I don't, I don't know what they have to say. So I'm going to ask questions and what they say is what I've heard for the first time too. So today's guest, and wait, before I go into that, let's talk about who I am. I am the wife expert. I help people stay married, be it a husband or a wife who's struggling with a spouse. If you have that in your life, call me. I will solve this for you. We can get your marriage back on track. There is no such thing as, it's too late. That's just a bunch of hogwash. There is no such thing as, it's too late. It, there's always a solution. And as long as nobody is you know, having an addiction or some kind of abuse, your marriage can be saved. I believe one person can change the temperature of their marriage. Just one person. So I don't really work with couples. I work with people individually. So if you have a problem, come see me on thewifeexpert.com, thewifeexpert.com, or you can visit me on thelifeexpert.com. So it's life or wife, life with an L or wife with a W. How about that? Um, also, I work with this company called Somvi, and they have the best bedding for beds on the planet. If you go to sleep, which we all do, right? If we go to sleep, you want to have the best sleep you possibly can. Somvi is dedicated to making your bed like a cloud. And I'm one of those weird people that I'm like so excited to go to bed because I know if I get a good night's sleep, my next day is going to be awesome. So don't discount the fact that you need to, you need to baby yourself, get the best sheets, get the best pillows. savi has got these pillows that are bigger than my whole body. And they're not like those, you know, huggable pillows. These are like big, gigantic square pillows. I got two of them and my husband hogged both of them. So I still don't have one. So I think I need to get a third. So, okay. So let's go to my guest who's coming on today. I met this lady at a conference. And she kind of, ha she's a marriage advocate as well. Um, she, the way I heard about her speak is that she was talking about her first husband, her only husband, and the difficulties they faced. And it's a story. And the more you hear other people's stories, the more of an opportunity you have to learn. Why and reinvent the wheel? Someone already paved the path. What did they do? What was their success? What was their failures? It is fascinating when you sit down with someone and don't talk about your life, but listen to theirs, especially people older than you. They have stories to tell about themselves and all the other people in their life. Don't ever discount that they don't have something to say. You just have to be patient and ask the right questions to hear what they have to say. So my guest, Colette, has a story, and I really don't know what that story is, and we're going to learn about it. She does have some things called boundaries, which most of you know how I feel about that. And let's find out. So here she is. Okay, so let's talk to Colette. Colette, like I told my audience, I really haven't had too much time to find out your story. But who is on this program are people who are married, who are suffering. And, you know, they're going through a hard time. And hearing other people's stories gives them hope. And I know your story doesn't end with your husband coming back together with you, but it ends with you becoming, I'm not going to spoil it. I only know the beginning and end, but I want to find out some stuff in the middle. So um, say hi. Tell us where you're from. Well, I'm originally from Utah, spent most of my life there, and uh, I've spent uh, a few years in um, Arizona and a few years in Alaska. And I spent a year and a half in Texas, and now here I am in Arizona, in Colorado. <laughs> so did you move around that much when you were married? Um, in between marriages. Okay. <laughs> well, some of it was in marriage. You know, we went to Arizona for um, my first husband's um, schooling. But, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so tell me about your first husband. How old were you when you got married? Got married. I was just 19 years old when we got married, so plenty young. But Why um, why did you get married? How old was he? He was 22 and uh 
So we thought we were in love and um, growing up in a religious community, um, we wanted to wait till we were married to um, be have physical relations. And so, um, and we just, we just thought we were ready and thought it was time. So we got married. <laughs> yeah. Cause 19, man, you know, everything. <laughs> that, that's right. That's, you know, you know, everything more, more at 19 than at any other age. <laughs> of course you were just expired. Okay. So you guys got married and did you have any kids? Yes. We had three daughters together. Oh, wow. Okay. How old are they today? The oldest is 39. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm doing the math on how old you are. Just kidding. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Keep going. 39. 39, 36, and 34. Okay. So take me back to when things got rough with your husband. Well, um, like most marriages, we had our rough patches here and there. And it was um, it was difficult while he was doing his um, medical internship and he was gone a lot, but I expected that it, that to be the case. So it wasn't, you know, a big shock like it was for some. And then when he was finished and we moved back home for him to um, pursue his practice, um, the time wise, it didn't get much better. And, uh, he was just gone all the time. And, um, I always wanted him to be my best friend, but never quite felt like I was. And he um, wound up giving that that uh, position to others, particularly women. And um, so there there began to be some rumors. And I thought, well, you know, hopefully it's just, you know, small town rumors. People make things up sometimes, you know, but... Um, Every once in a while, I'd get a call from a friend or something asking me if I was okay. And, and I would, you know, say, yeah, I'm fine. Why? And <laughs> then a time or two, I actually asked him, you know, you know, I said, we're okay. Right. And, and he was, he was a good liar. And, um, you know, so I believed him and, and I didn't want to, um, ruin a, a, a possibly good marriage. <laughs> It was like I say, not not a hundred percent, but I mean, what marriage is? But you know, good enough, I thought, and um, could always be better. But so you were just going along, and then when did you finally get whiff of like, uh oh, this is not so good? Yeah, well, I I had a feeling just before our oldest daughter. I think it was a you know a spiritual premonition or whatever you want to call it. I had the feeling that maybe something was going on, but our, we were planning our oldest daughter's wedding. And so I just said to the Lord, if there is something going on, I don't want to know until after the wedding. So about six weeks after the wedding, um, one night I felt like I was awoken, awakened in the middle of the night and told to go check on my husband. And at that point he was having some insomnia and just having a hard time getting to sleep or staying to sleep. And so he had started getting up and um, getting on the internet and communicating with people and playing games and communicating. And so, so I wandered into towards his office to see what was going on. And he was sitting there in his um, overstuffed chair that I had bought him for Father's Day, but it was facing the doorway. And so he had his back towards me. But if he'd been paying attention, he should have been able to see me from the side. But he was engrossed in his game and his conversation. And so I stood there for however long it was. It was at least a half hour, maybe 45 minutes while he played this game and and uh, communicated with this woman. And most of it was fairly innocent. But at the end, when they finally decided, well, it's getting pretty late, I guess we better go to bed. And so they um, in type. They had, they romantically hugged and kissed goodbye. And so then my husband closed his computer and I kind of jumped at him and scared him. And, and, uh, I, I didn't freak out at that point. I just said, I don't like it. It's inappropriate and it needs to stop. And he said, okay, I'll stop. So we just went back to bed. And then the next day, um, he decided, and he told me later, that because I hadn't freaked out at the um, internet infidelity, <laughs> uh, 
that maybe it was time to um, tell me a little bit more. Because he told me later that he'd been wanting to stop, but that he didn't he didn't think he could until he told me, but he was afraid that I couldn't handle it and he didn't want to lose me. So, so the next day he told me that he had kissed a couple of women and then I fell apart and I just knew that there was more to the story and I just kind of lived with it the rest of the day. But then when we went to bed, I said to him, I just know there's more and you need to tell me. And he said, but I don't want to lose you. I don't want to lose you. And I said, well, if you don't tell me, you will lose me. But if you do tell me, you'll at least have a chance. So he told me the rest of the story and uh, how he'd been um, intimate with his main um, medical assistant. And then he was also a commander of a small military unit. And um, his right-hand man was a woman. <laughs> and he became friends and then intimate with her also. Except he couldn't do both of them at the same time. It was okay to cheat on me, but it wasn't okay to cheat on his mistress with another mistress. Oh, of course not. You can't do that. Oh my God, how inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> so, when, so when the second one, I mean, she literally was, you know, begging him to get her pregnant and, and leave me and be with her. And he wouldn't do that. And he, he said that he told them, and it was confirmed by the medical assistant, that he'd all, he told them that I was the best and he'd never leave me. But, you know... It was okay to, you know, have one at home and one at work and one with the military, whatever, you know, anyway. So um, when when the military one found out that, she, you know, she wasn't going to be able to literally steal him away from me, then she said, we're done, although they remained friends. And um, so then he went back to messing around with his medical assistant. And, uh, and that went on for at least four years. And... Um, did he tell you all this or was this just stuff you found out later? He told me. I can't so remember. So when did he when did when did he say he started cheating on you? Um he just said it was at least 4 years. Okay. Um okay. At that. did anything did it, sorry I'm just trying That's to okay. understand. Did anything happen prior to um him cheating on you the first time? Not that I'm aware of. Like it like a death or something? The only thing that I can think of is if it started during this time when um, there for a while I uh, began to feel like a piece of meat and, you know, he'd come home after a long day and be ornery and, and then we'd go to bed and he'd, you know, want some, you know, and it's like, I didn't feel any connection, although trying to be a dutiful wife, I tried to let him have it, you know, but, but wasn't, it wasn't the kind of intimacy that we both wanted, you know? Mm -hmm. So eventually I got feeling depressed and went to the doctor and the doctor gave, you know, sent me to a counselor and in talking to the counselor, he discovered we have a marital problem here. And, and I had asked my husband to go to counseling with me um, a time or two before. And he said, no, I don't have time. And it, the first time it was, we can't afford it and et cetera, you know? And so, um, but when it, but when I'd gone to counseling myself and then the counselor said, you need to have your husband come in, he decided because it was, you know, it was for me, it was my problem. It was, for, it was to help me, you know, it wasn't really his problem. So he decided to come in and, Anyway, we, um, I felt like we got things worked out at that point because, um, the counselor helped me and my husband helped me to learn that that was the, his, in his mind, his best way of showing me that he loved me, you know, was the sex and in, and the counselor helped me, um, well, also to understand that, but the counselor helped my husband to understand that I needed some time and attention um, before sex, you know, like when he comes home, instead of coming home on me, come home and give me a hug and maybe help with the dishes or things like that. You know, that women are generally different than men and, you know, we need yeah, to. Yeah. That's why there's that book. So how old were you at this point when you found out about this whole cheating thing? And uh, I was about night? 40 because we had been married 21 years. So yeah, I was, I was 40. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, how did it, how did it play out? So I, um, even though it hurt me deeply, I was devastated, but, um, 
with the way I had been brought up and in the religious community and whatnot, I just felt like um, marriage was supposed to be forever and that, you know, you're supposed to do what you can to to save it and to make it work, even though this was horribly, and I never expected this to happen, you know, but mm. so I wanted to try and save the marriage. And um, I spent over three years in my mind working on it, but um, my husband felt like nothing needed to change other than his infidelity. You know, he didn't need to give, give me any more time. He didn't need to, he didn't need to quit working with that medical assistant because he'd spent 10 years training her and, you know, oh, I, you know, don't make me start over again. And, you know, and so it was just incredibly hard for me to know that he was still with her day in and day out and even have Absolutely. to listen to conversations in the evening when he was home and she, you know, and they needed to communicate about something medical. And it was like, it was, it was just so wrong. And then hard. later, then later I found out, well, I expected after, um, after a year or so with, um, disciplinary action from our church and stuff in my stupid head, I thought that, you know, certain things would happen that I wanted to happen and he didn't have a clue and didn't, didn't feel the same, you know, like, cause I, even, cause I even got thinking, well, you know, if we divorced, um, and I remarried, I would be with somebody that had most likely been with somebody else, been, been married before, or, you know, who knows how many. And so I thought, but if so, if I just focus on a new marriage, if, if my husband and I could say, let's put the past in the past, let's start over again with a new marriage, even if it was just simple little vows between us of a recommitment, you know, and love and et cetera, you know, that things could get better. Well, um, that wasn't his idea. It was just my silly little princess idea, I guess, you know, and so it didn't happen. And then eventually he, um, he did get me a new wedding ring, but he, he wanted me to help pick it out, which he hadn't done before with my, you know, with the first one, he just got it on his own. And, and it was, happened to be the day before mother's day. And so, and my, in my mind, I'm hoping, you know, please let him present it to me like a, you know, please marry me again. And please let you know, let's start a new marriage and a new relationship, you know, and, well, that was not part of his thinking process. And so on Sunday morning, when the girls came in with their little Mother's Day gifts and, and gave their gifts to me, I opened them. And then, so then my husband goes in his closet and gets his little jewelry bag with the ring in it. Cause I, you know, they had asked me at the store, do you want to wear it home? And I says, no, I want it later, you know? And, and so he brings the little bag out, hadn't taken time to wrap it or anything, just hands me the little bag, the jewelry bag, and, and said, you know, I don't think he actually said it, but it was more or less, here's, here's your Mother's Day present from me, you know, and in my mind, and, and, and when we went shopping for the ring, we had not discussed it. He's just going, oh, do you like this one? Do you like that one? And I'm, and it wasn't the kind of ring that had a wedding band with it. So I wasn't sure if it was just a fun ring that says, maybe says, I love you, or is it a wedding ring, you know, and, and he hadn't told me. So when I took it out of the box, I wasn't this pretty. And I put it on my right hand because I didn't know if it was supposed to be a new wedding ring. So that hurt him a lot. And, um, I later found out. And so then we kind of discussed it and uh, I don't remember exactly what was said then, but things just kind of went downhill from there. And, um, and I began to find out that he was still keeping secrets from me, even if he wasn't necessarily doing the unfaithful acts anymore. But um, you can't you can't be re rebuild a marriage and rebuild trust. Number one, when there's not any time together, and number two, when there's you know there's no trust because you're keeping secrets, you know. Yeah. And so I, you know, I began to check up on him a little bit and just to make sure that he was doing what he was supposed to do. Cause I had a friend who did that and her friend was 100% doing everything right. And after six months of checking up on him, she felt confident that he was very, very sorry after the one time and, um, and that, you know, he was committed and he, you know, but that wasn't the case with my husband and, 
he just wanted, he, he told me what I wanted to hear and then did what he wanted, you know? And, mm-hmm. um, so, so just to be clear, I wanted to make sure everyone knows you and I just met and you've already been through all of this. So you and I haven't worked together. I haven't coached you. You in fact are a coach yourself. So which we can get into in a couple seconds. So, um, keep going. So what I'm curious about is what, so how many years after you discovered him in the chair in that room, which by the way, I believe women have the most amazing intuition when their partners are doing things that we need to know about somehow, some way we get the memo in our tummies, in our head, like some kind of nervous twitch. We're like, what is that? Oh, and then we follow the path like cookies. And then there we go. Ooh, the surprise. Our husband's cheating on us. Oh, so that's quite common. I'm so sad I didn't know you back then. But okay, so walk me down the path of what happened. So you're kind of figuring this out. And what made you go, I'm getting divorced? Because I'm assuming that was you, right? In the end, it was somewhat mutual because when he found out that I was checking up on him, he didn't like that, you know, mm-hmm. so mama. <laughs> so, and in the beginning, I didn't want to do that. I, somebody told me to do that. And I, and I thought, no, that'll just make marriage worse, you know, and I wanted to trust and to believe, but in the end, and after thinking about what my other friend had said and how it had worked out for her, I thought, okay, let me try it. And it, but it didn't work out for me. And so in the end, we decided to make a one last ditch effort to um, save our marriage by taking a vacation together. And I was hoping for some romance or at least, you know, the physical part so that because I knew it would help me feel better. And I and I thought, you know, it would make me feel closer to him and hopefully it would make him feel closer to me. And maybe we could work through that. But but he had the idea that, you know, we're just going as friends and we'll see how, how she acts and, you know, and it just, we just didn't have the connection. And, um, we kind of forced it once and it was like, it was, it was not good. So we came home knowing that things were not in a good place. And then a few days later, um, the, I, I felt like the Lord led me to a phone call that he had when he thought I was going to be leaving for a, you know, a couple hours. And he, he hid down in the theater room with the door closed and had a two hour conversation with this woman who, um, a new woman who he was beginning to have an online or not online and, uh, an emotional affair with. And, um, and I sat there on the other door and listened to it. And, you know, and normally I'm not that kind of person that would do that. But when you need to know what's going on with your marriage and you're told to go listen, you do it, you know, yep, it just shows up. It's amazing. Right. Yeah, and absolutely. I really believe that. And I, those things give me the chills because it yeah. just says you're not alone. Someone's looking yep. out for you. So, yes. okay. So how soon after that listening of that call, did you get divorced? Well, when he was done with his phone call, I walked in and I said, I think we're done. When you want to talk about it, let me know. And I can't remember if we talked about it anymore in the next, I think that was a Friday. On Sunday, we both went in and talked to our religious leader individually and told him we're done. We're getting a divorce. And I think that following week, within a few days, we we did the um, paperwork online. And at that point, we we weren't angry with each other. We were just done. And yeah. we hope to stay friends and especially for the sake of our kids, you know, we didn't want things to get ugly. So we just did fill out the paperwork online, sent it in. And within three weeks we were divorced. What state are you in? <laughs> I think it's changed a little bit, but it was, oh, I, we oh. were in, we were in Utah. I think they're, okay. I think they um, have a longer waiting list now. Yeah. Cause in Utah, isn't it like, wait, why are you divorcing? You're just get another wife. <laughs> <laughs> They're collecting. Why are you getting married? No, 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 no. <laughs> I know that's the running joke, but that's not the case. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's get it clear. Okay. So, okay. So now you're divorced. You got divorced at what age? Uh, let's see. I was about to turn 45. Okay. Just a couple okay. of so weeks. So 45 year old, almost 45, single. How, what do you do now? How do you, how do you get back on your feet? 
Yeah, that was tough. I um I decided I when we were, had lived in um Arizona, we had um taken ballroom dance lessons while we were in the Phoenix area and and I knew that they would take people right off the street or even sometimes, you know, an old a student, previous student and turn them into a dance instructor and I thought what better more positive place I could could I be than in a dance studio. And I I've, I've always loved to dance and um and we actually did a fair amount of uh, ballroom dancing together as um as amateurs and then we also competed with pro partners too there while we were married for a while. So I decided to um go to Arizona and um and become a dance teacher. But um it didn't last last a very long time because I was missing my kids and I had also met somebody just before I left. And he was tired of waiting for me to come back. And so it was mostly because of my kids. And initially when I first came back, um, I decided that, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to date that man anymore, but, um, so hold on a second. You, when you left to go to Arizona, how old were your kids? Uh, my youngest had just graduated from high school. We actually okay. divorced. Okay. Um, in November, just, um, just before Thanksgiving, the year of my, our daughter's, um, senior year in high school. And I promised her that I would stay there until she graduated, which I did. And, um, so then it was that summer and I was hoping she would come with me, but she decided to stay. And did um, she stay? Did you, did your husband keep the family home? He did initially. Yes. Okay. It was, it was a big house and there was still a big mortgage on it. And I couldn't afford to pay for it. And so he was supposed to pay me my half of the equity that was in it at, you know, when, when she turned 18 and which didn't happen, but eventually it did a little bit, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there. But, um, anyway, so he kept the home, then he wound up losing his job and having to move. And so then he wound up renting the house and, you know, he just wound up in all kinds of problems, both financially and um, women wise, wife wise, and it's how many times you said, you said he's been married a bunch of times. How many times was he married? He's, um, he's on his fourth marriage now. And I think it's, I think this one might actually last. So for, for his sake and the sake of our kids, I hope it does, but, um, he's still not as, as attentive to the kids and the grandkids as I feel like he should be, but maybe it's partly his own mental problems that, you know, makes it hard for him. I don't know, but that's one thing I've learned to do is to compartmentalize things and people and th and things in people because none of us are 100% good and none of us are 100% bad. And mm -hmm. it's okay to, to acknowledge and, um, and, and praise the good parts of people, even, even though they have some bad parts in them, you know? So he had this, yep, yep. he had this one problem and it was probably caused by mental issues and things that possibly happened in his childhood. And, you know, and so, um, is that anyway. cheating? Um, well, no, I don't know that he had, there was any of that in his family, but, um, yeah, his, his dad, his parents got married very young, especially his mother. His father was, um, about five years older, but his mom was only 15 when, um, when they needed to get married. And, um, so, and she had three children by the time she was 18 and then his father oh, was an, oh and then his father was an alcoholic. And, okay. um, so, but he says his father was a happy drunk. You know, he didn't remember anything. <laughs> and any bad stuff you know that's when he sang that's when he you know played the guitar and sang is when he was drunk you know and but yet he did have so, to go so, to your go husband, help. those memories of his dad being an alcoholic were all positive yes yeah okay <laughs> it's like you could have a fall down drunk dad or you could have an alcoholic dad who's hilarious as long as it's not hurting you and you know money's still coming in you know, I don't, it's just what that child takes away from it. So right. If it's a negative thought, then it's damaging. If it's a positive thought, it it's, it's family. Yeah. But I, he did say that sometimes he would, uh, his mother would take him with her down to the bar to find him and bring him home. 
So yeah, now whether that they had a bad that. effect, you know, I'm guessing it might have, but who knows. When he was when it was two AM and she had to wake him up to go find dad and where was dad and they weren't sure, that's that can be traumatic. So yeah. is that the same thing your husband started to pick up? Did he have an alcoholic problem? alcohol problem as well no um he did uh when he was be becoming friends with some of these other people especially when the one in the military that did drink um he and and being a doctor he knew that you know he, he knew that he probably had that tendency in him and you know from his hereditary from his father you know possibly mm -hmm. and so he shied away from that but he started sometimes drinking the non-alcoholic non -alcoholic beers and stuff like that, just so he could, you know, I, in my mind, in my opinion, so he could fit in, you know. Yeah. Although I did hear him say after we divorced that he he went and um, had a date um, in the city and uh, with some, I don't even know who it was, but, but for New Year's Eve, he did, you know, he did drink, he did have a shot of something and I'm going just because it was New Year's Eve and because he wanted to try it or something like that. And I'm going, yeah. And that's just something in, in our culture that we grew up in, in our religious culture that, you know, you just don't do that. But, um, mm. but luckily he did not, as far as I know, later on and certainly not in our marriage that I know of <laughs> didn't fall into the, the alcohol tendency. So okay. what was his, uh, choice of destruction? <laughs> well, I would have to say, you know, women, I guess, you know? So he had, how long was he married to wife number two? Oh, about, a couple years, I think. Wife number three. Um, it was longer. Um, gosh, I don't. I'm not sure. Five or six years, maybe. Hmm. And they, um, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to know how personal to get here, you know, and how much to share. But um, I, so we're not saying your last name, and no one knows you. <laughs> and the only way, it's not like your husband's going to wander into something called the wife expert. <laughs> well, that wife number three had a lot of problems and she had, she had some drug problems. He sent her to rehab several times and both wife number two and three were the same age as our oldest daughter. Uh, and... <laughs> what about wife number four? How old is she? She's, um, I don't know exactly. She's at least 10, if, if not pushing 15 years younger than he is, but at least, okay, but okay. at least she's not 27 years younger than he is, you know? Yeah. And yeah. So, so what I find interesting and what most of my listeners know is that when you kind of fail with the first wife, it's really hard to, to catch up and find something good again when you don't spend the time and learn what happened with the first one. And do the work and figure out, well, what did I do wrong? Everyone wants to blame. Well, if she would have done this, then maybe this would have worked. Well, because if you say, well, what went wrong with your marriage? Everyone goes, if it's the guy, he goes, well, my wife should have done that. It's never, you know, I was a shitty husband. It's always the blame on the other person. And it's, the, it's this time that we look at ourselves and go, well, what did I do wrong? Because when you figure that out, then the next person that comes along, you're going to go, oh, I'm not going to do that again. Because there's this phrase, wherever you go, there you are. So no matter who you're with next or next or next, you're going to be the same person if you don't change. Right. So did you marry again? I did, unfortunately. <laughs> are you still married? No. Okay. What happened with I him? Well, with the second husband, I, um, first of all, I'm a people pleaser and I'm, a um, and I feel bad for people. And so not only did I want to be married again, but I didn't just, I did, didn't just go for the first one, you know, but I wasn't as choosy as I should have been. And, um, he didn't make much money and I, and I thought, well, I, you know, it's okay. I can deal with it. And, but then in getting married, we just, we just were not very compatible at all. And, um, 
it it was just a real struggle. I kind of knew from from the get go that it wasn't good and kind of wanted out. But I spent seven years trying to make it work. And after having been moved to Alaska far away from my family for for three and a half years, I finally said being so far away from my family and not being able to watch my grandchildren grow up and et cetera, you know, for an unhappy marriage just isn't worth it. So I finally ended that one. Good for you. Do you think your husband and you will ever get back together? How come? I always ask that question because I'm always curious. Cause you know, I always say you never know. Cause you could be two different people by the time you're 80 and end up in the same old home together and you never know. <laughs> Well, anything's possible, but um, but I doubt it. Um, my youngest daughter has told me a time or two that she wished that, you know, and has, has wished ever since that we would get back together again, you know, and, but. All kids want that. All kids want their parents to get back together. Even when they're grown up. Yep. It's not just the little kids. It's, yeah, it's always. It's forever. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the thing that is hardest for me is to know how the divorce has affected the kids and that they don't have um, an intact family and, and home to come home to for visits or for holidays and things like that, you know, and, and um, for the most part, we've tried to stay friends and there have been times that it's been easy and sometimes not so easy. And um, so it's, it's yeah, not as yeah, good as I would like it to be, but yeah. That's hard. I mean, the, the greatest thing you can do is like, you know, whoever you decide to marry again, if it's not going to be your original husband to make sure, listen, if you take into my, if you come into my life, these people I will be seeing on Christmas and Thanksgiving and they are my world. That's so right. cause what happens is when you bring that other person and they're like, no, 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 we're not spending time with your kids. We're not spending time with your ex. It, you set up what you said, boundaries, you set up the parameters of what, sorry, you told me boundaries off camera, but it's, you set up the expectations of these people are important to me and I'm going to see these people. Yes. Or we're not going to be together because they were here first. That's right. <laughs> sorry. And that's and why it was so hard yeah, for me yeah. when I went to Alaska for three and a half years. And I did make a few visits back, but, um, but it was so expensive and so hard and, and, you know, and it made my husband angry every time that I did leave. And, you know, I, I, I missed so many important things while I was gone, you know, and it's, yeah, it yeah. was fine. Like, I just can't do this anymore. My family's too important to me. Yeah. You can't, you don't get that time back, right? Nobody realizes that. It's like, oh, let me just DVR you and hit pause on you. I'm going to go over there for a while. When I come back, everything's going to be the same. No, it's not how that works. So tell me, tell me what your greatest, what did you learn most from all of your experiences? Any life tips? Well, I, I learned that boundaries can make a difference. Um, tell me about that. So when the first thing that I realized, um, before I found out what my husband had been doing, um, the first time I saw his assistant climb into my seat in, in my husband's vehicle to ride to work with him really upset me. And, and I just, I just thought it was so wrong and I just hated it and, you know, felt violated, but because I had not been taught the certain boundaries, I mean, the big boundaries, the obvious boundaries, yes, you know, but the little ones that help keep you from getting to the big ones, I hadn't been taught. I hadn't heard them, you know, so I didn't know that there was anything wrong with um people who are not single of the opposite sex riding alone in a vehicle together and especially when they do it regularly you know and and so i thought to myself well you're just being a stupid silly jealous woman and so i never said anything but so if how i do, just, how do you, yeah go ahead keep going go if ahead. i had said something at that point i think our marriage was good enough at that point that he probably would have said oh I'd never thought of it that way. Okay, let's rethink this. Or how else can we do this? Or, you know, or at the very least, if he had said, no, you're just up in the night or you're just silly and, you know, jealous or whatever, 
that might have rung an extra bell in my head that said something's not right here, you mm -hmm. know. And so after thinking about that and spending, you know, it's been 17 years now since my first husband and I divorced. Um, I've, I've thought a lot about it and what, what other boundaries could you put in place that would, um, safeguard your marriage? And it's got to be done with, um, two people who are both good people who love each other very much and who want their relationship and their marriage to last forever. And, and therefore uh, realize that, you know, it can happen to anybody. I mean, in most ways, my first husband was a good man. But he he let things get out of hand and didn't put those boundaries in place and then easily fell. So it can happen to anybody. So knowing that, um, then it's important to put those boundaries into place and then check with each other regularly. It could even be daily, it could be weekly, whatever it is. But But do it in a loving way, maybe even in a playful way, you know, so that you can check up on each other or or even better yet, ask your spouse for help. If somebody at work is hitting on you, you know, and, and you, you know, if it's irritating you, then maybe that's one thing and maybe it's, you don't need to talk about it so much. But if it's, if they're interesting you, then you better be talking about it with your spouse. Say, hey, this person is, you know, seems to be really interested in me and, and, you know, I kind of like it, but I love you a whole lot more. And I want this, you know, to maintain this, this relationship with you. So help me. Yeah. So, so do you think like today's people would even say that? Like if I was working at a job, I haven't done that in a while. And someone started hitting on me, I would probably be like, well, that was nice. Like I, I'm old. That feels good. It wouldn't, I'd go home and I'd probably never even say anything to my husband about it. And it would be so innocent, right? Right. So right. It starts out about, innocent. When you talk about a boundary, is it a boundary or is it more like a, a respect rule? Like you respect me enough that you're going to share these with me. I'm just curious. Yeah. Well, or, I, I think or, that, I think some of the things are, are strict boundaries and others are, just respect, you know, so that you share. Yeah. Um, it, I think it's a combination of the two. Yeah. Okay. So like the car thing, like don't have, don't go take rides from, so if you're, you know, if you live an hour from work and there's four people that live near you, three of them are hot girls in your office <laughs> and you're a lawyer and do you not take them? And then how, how, how do you have that conversation? Does it start when you first marry? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Yes. I, I recommend that um, those that hear about this before getting married have that conversation when they get engaged before getting married. And, uh, and if you're already married and things are good, then start having the conversation. Now, if problems have already occurred, as long as both um, partners want to fix the marriage, you can use these same boundaries to help fix the marriage. If it's done in a, in a cooperative, collaborative, loving way, it can still, still work. But um, ideally, yeah, I would like couples to discuss it and, and put these boundaries and, and respectful things in place before even getting married when they yeah, are planning I, yeah, I, to get married. I, I think in some religions, like they have some of those in place. Um, particularly, I'm thinking of a Jewish friend of mine who had all these things. Oh, no, 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 you can't do that. No, 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 you can't come within like five feet of my space. No, 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 I'm not allowed to hug strangers. I'm not a stranger, we work together. Yeah, but I can't hug you. Oh, okay. So I, I always thought that was really cool. I think those kind of come through a religion too, right? Yes, it does. Yeah. But I have a good example to share of yeah, um, please, please. Some, someone who, um, who put up the boundaries. And I, I was at a conference once and um, in a in class group situation. And afterwards, I, I went to a restaurant to, um, to have dinner. And I went and sat down and then shortly after I saw one of the men 
from uh, the same class come out and sit down all over a ways away. And I'm, I was fairly newly divorced at that time. And I'm just learning to put myself out there and just to be not, you know, I wasn't even looking for someone to date or somebody to hit on or anything like just to be more open and more, I mean, cause I, I've traditionally been uh, quite a shy person, you know? So I was just trying to learn how to put myself out there and to just be um, friendly and outgoing, you know? So I saw this gentleman over the, over there a ways and, and I just recognized him and, and he looked at me and I just went, Oh, hi, you know, waved. Oh, hi. That's all I expected. But after a minute, you know, I could see him kind of squirming in his chair. He got up and left. And on the one hand, I felt a little silly because I really wasn't trying to hit on you. That wasn't my intent. If it came across that way, I'm really, really sorry. And I felt really stupid. On the other hand, I was so proud of him because he was defending and protecting and taking care of his marriage. Yeah, and, yeah. and I just, it just right, blew me right. away. <laughs> That's the that. way we should be, you know. You, um, not that, not that you don't have, you know, f- friendships or, um, but, but do them in groups and in couples and in, you know, just don't allow it to get down to the one-on-one, especially when it's a regular thing, you know. But. But it's better not to just do the the first one on one in the first place because, um, you know, it's innocent, and then you get to know each other, you get to like each other, you get comfortable, and before you know it, you can be headed down the wrong path. Oh yeah, like if everyone had that rule where if you went to a bar, you can't talk to strange women, or strange women can't talk to the, anyone else if there's a wedding ring on. <gasps> can you imagine how different this world would be if this was like a repellent? It just smells bad. Everyone in the bar would be like, oh, he's married. It smells bad. I got to get out of the way. And some some people like don't even about care. Boundaries. You know? <laughs> yep. Some people don't care whether, you know, whether somebody's married or not. They're going to go after him, you know? So, yeah. yeah I know that's there not true. to go after him, but, you know, but for us, we need to, we need to put up our own boundaries so that we don't fall into their traps. No, that I, I agree with you. I think that's, it's a very interesting position to have those, especially it's like something you can teach to kids, you know, young girls, you know, listen, yeah, listen. you know, you know, like sex. It's like that there, there's so much pressure out there for these young teens. You know, I am not to change the subject, but you know, at my kids high school, it's like the ch- entire cheerleading team started cutting themselves. And so all the other girls started cutting themselves because it was cool. So if you got a group of girls and someone's like, oh, I'm having a sex with this married man, all the other girls start to do it too. It's a, it's a boundary you can set up with your friends to say, that's not a good idea. In, in my world with midlife crisis, if, you're, if you set up a boundary with your midlife crisis husband who doesn't want to be married anyway, he's going to go, okay, bye-bye. And then off he's going to run. They don't really work in some situations that I, I deal with women in. But I can definitely see how they work in the situations that you brought up. And thank you for sharing that. And thank you for sharing your story. You're an amazing woman. And I know you're going to be an amazing coach and an amazing speaker. I think that's right up your alley. I can't wait to hear what you do. Thank you. I I appreciate the invite. And your career. Thank you. I appreciate the invite to join you on your podcast. And I can tell already what an amazing person that you are and all the good that you're doing in the world. And and thank you for doing it. Yeah, I'm trying to be a marriage advocate to make people stop and think, you know, before they jump off that cliff. You know, that's it. Just, you know, take another, you know, what, what can we do? How can we do it? And I work with women and men. I don't work with couples, just one at a time, you know, and your story is what people need to be asking other people. Like, tell me what to do. What did you do? What did you do? That's how we learn. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel. It's already been done. Done. (laughs) Marriage has been going on for thousands of years, even before that. Anyway. All right, Colette, you're amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I know this was a big time crunch for you, so I appreciate it. And we will talk soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Colette. Bye. That was amazing. That was Colette. 
Colette came on the show and did you hear her? She was just a little worried, like, oh, what can I talk about? What can I say? She's brave. She came on this story to tell us her story. Sorry. She came on this episode to tell us her story so that we can learn from her. And it's interesting, though. Maybe if she would have done a few things differently back when she was with her husband, they might not have gotten divorced. Maybe, maybe not. But she didn't take that path, and that's where she is now. Could they connect again? Absolutely. Is it going to take some work? And it's not going to take some work for her to him. It's going to take some work for her on the inside to forgive him. And same thing with him. But it is possible. And that's what I teach. So if you have a spouse or someone you were in love with and you want to hook back up with them and connect back again, call me. Come to thewifeexpert.com. I am here to help you. This is what I do. I talk to people all day long who want to get their spouse back or want to connect back with an old love if they never were married. I help people do that. I help people stay married. And I can help you. So come to thewifeexpert.com or thelifeexpert.com, and I will see you there. And please, if you want to pass this show on to somebody else, hit send. Send this on to someone else who might need to hear it, because I appreciate you, and thank you for coming here and watching and listening.